enough DNA to fill the head of a pin, the amount of information that little bit of DNA would carry would be equivalent to a stack of books from the earth to the moon 240 times. Or equivalent to a stack of CDs flat 110 kilometers high. Richard Dawkins, the atheist evolutionist in Britain, the leading evolutionist at Oxford University, says that the amount of DNA in every cell of your and my body is equivalent to three to four sets of the 20 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. That is a lot of information. And that information determines whether you have big bones or small bones, whether you're female or male, whether you have blonde hair or brown hair, blue eyes or green eyes, uh, and all the other features about your uh, life. The DNA information is what determines whether the peas will be yellow or green or in between, whether they'll be wrinkled or smooth or in between. These were the, the kinds of uh, peas that Gregor Mendel studied in his tea garden outside his little parish home in Czechoslovakia right at the time that Darwin was publishing his theory. And he didn't know about the DNA but he knew there was something inside the peas that was controlling the expression of color and texture. The DNA is what produces this variety in horses. Big horses, little horses, horses with different color hair, different size feet, etc. It's the DNA that determines the skin color in human beings. These kids are all at one school in Washington, D.C. They all have the same skin color. It's just that some of them have DNA saying make a lot of skin color and some of them have DNA saying make just a little bit of skin color. Now, let's consider natural selection. First thing we need to know is that natural selection is a fact. All creationists believe in natural selection if they're informed. And they always have. In fact, there was a British geologist by the name of Edward Blythe who wrote about the principle of natural selection in a scientific journal in England 30 years before Darwin published his theory. So creationists believe in natural selection. But natural selection is not evolution. And this is where the evolutionists uh, deceive us. They will equate natural selection and evolution so they give examples of natural selection and say, see, evolution is a fact. No, Evolution and natural selection are not the same thing. Remember, evolution is changing one kind of creature into another. All creatures, plants or animals, are descended from a common ancestor. Secondly, natural selection is a conservative process, not a creative process. Nature can only select what's already there. It can't create something new that's not there. It selects what is there. So it's conservative it's preserving something of what's already there. Now, let's illustrate this. Take the genus Canis, the dog kind. Uh, this picture is taken from an evolutionary uh, biology textbook, and they show us that uh, all of these different creatures, the coyote, red wolf, jackal, dingo, uh, are all related to the domestic dog. They can interbreed and uh, some of them can interbreed naturally in the wild. They could probably all interbreed naturally, uh, uh, if it was uh, organized by scientists. And so evolutionists believe that all of these different kinds of dogs are actually descended from a common ancestor. And creationists would agree with them. Something like a wolf. But the question is, where did the first dog come from? Not how do you get the variety, but where did the first dog come from? So they would say, the evolutionists would say, and creationists would agree that from something that looked like a wolf... We got coyotes and dingles and collies and eventually all the domestic dogs, including poodles. But this is not evolution. What we need to realize is that this process of change actually involves a loss of genetic information. The poodle does not have all the genetic information that the wolf had. It's lost, been lost in the process of reproduction. So we didn't create something new with a poodle. All the genetic information for making a poodle was there in the original uh, wolf population. Now let's il illustrate this idea further considering hair length. Suppose you have two dogs coming off the ark in the days of Noah and uh, they have medium length hair and they have in their genetic information 
a, a gene for making long hair and a gene for making short hair. It's more complicated than this. Uh, there are more genes involved, but it, it's a, an accurate representation in simple terms of what's going on. Now, if those two dogs mate, what are they going to produce? Well, Mendel's genetics will uh, accurately predict for us that they will produce some puppies that have short hair. They get the short hair gene from mom and the short hair gene from dad. Some puppies will be medium length hair. They will have a long and short hair gene. And some of the puppies will be long haired. They'll only get the long haired gene from mom and dad. Now, if we breed those two long haired dogs, what will happen? Well, they will produce nothing but long haired puppies because they have lost the genetic information for producing short haired offspring. We don't have a creation of a new kind of dog. We have a conservation of existing genetic information was, that was there with the original parents. So the, uh, the dogs come off the ark. They're in a, a pack there and they're all intermingling, but there's no reason for them to all stay together. So they start having puppies and they start traveling and migrating, looking for new sources of food. And some of those dogs begin to migrate up into Europe and it's getting colder every winter. And the farther north they go, the colder it gets. And pretty soon the short-haired dogs can't make it through the winter. They freeze to death. And uh, going far enough north, pretty soon only the long-haired dogs make it through the winter. Nature has selected the long-haired dogs because they have the characteristics that will allow them to live in that environment. But all the information for long hair was in the puppies that came off the ark. Conversely, you have some of the dogs moving into Africa. The farther south they go the more the dogs with long hair are panting to beat the band. They can't cool their system off. And pretty soon they die of overheating in the summer. But the short-haired dogs are just basking in the sun. They're just enjoying it. This is fantastic. So they survive the summer and have puppies. And pretty soon all you've got is short-haired dogs in Africa. Nature has selected those varieties for a particular environment to preserve some of the created kind. So natural selection can explain the survival of the fittest, but it does not explain the arrival of the fittest, which is the real question. It doesn't explain where the dogs came from in the first place. It just explains how the dogs can survive in different environments. We want to know where the dogs came from in the first place. Darwin's theory of natural selection never explained that. So natural selection from a creationist perspective is the God-designed method of preserving representatives of the original created kinds. God knew that the environment would change after the, the fall of Adam and Eve and after the flood. And so he created those creatures at the beginning with the ability to adapt to changing environments to preserve representatives of those original created kinds. So natural selection doesn't prove goo to you via the zoo. It doesn't prove microbe to microbiologist evolution. It doesn't prove that a single cell creature evolved into all the different kinds of plants and animals because natural selection is only a conservative process, not a creative one. Well, what about mutations? Do they supply the new information for evolution? These poor critters uh, have been the object of many evolutionary experiments for many decades. Fruit flies. They take these fruit flies, start with two normal ones up here at the top, and they bombard them with radiation to see what kinds of mutations they can produce. And they produce fruit flies with fringed wings and fruit flies with little itty-bitty vestigial wings and fruit flies with no wings at all or fruit flies with an extra set of wings but no muscles to run those wings so those extra wings get in the way of the ones that do work or fruit flies with legs, an extra set of legs growing out of their eyeballs, all kinds of variety from these mutations. But none of these fruit flies are an improvement on the fruit fly. And none of them would survive in the wild. Nature would select the healthy, normal ones and weed out these mutants. The only reason they survive is because they're in the laboratory where the scientists protect them for their experiments. So, we need to realize that mutations are a fact. All creationists believe in, in mutations, even though sometimes evolutionists imply that we don't. But... Mutations nearly always reduce the genetic information. They never increase functional information. Lee Spetner is a Jewish scientist, 